Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone else. Oh, it's good to hear your voices. That was just so beautiful. Both of those cello pieces with the piano just happens to be my, my favorite combination of musical instruments, piano and cello. So beautiful. Uh, I was just thinking um, as I was sitting there listening to that breathtaking music, I was thinking of something I read years ago, um, uh, agnostic, maybe even atheist philosopher, was working through all the arguments in favor of the existence of God. So he was doing all of this, you know, high scientific and philosophical thinking regarding the ontological argument for the existence of God and the teleological argument for the existence of God and the cosmological argument for the existence of God. And he worked through all of these arguments in favor of God's existence. And when he was done, he still didn't believe. Intellectually, he was not persuaded. And then, and then at the end of the article I was reading, he said there was a piece of evidence that, that he hadn't yet considered that was brought to the table. And this is what he said. He said, if music were the only piece of evidence at my disposal, I would believe in the existence of God. He crossed the line from unbelief to belief because of the weight of beauty that is inherent in sound in the form of music. I mean, think about that for a minute. We're going to discover this evening that, in fact, God is saving the world through the mechanism of beauty. God is saving the world through beauty. And music is one of the channels through which God communicates to the mind and to the heart. Just amazing. It brings a sense of order, doesn't it? I mean, think about it for a minute. Music, if you want a definition of music... This is the best definition I've ever been able to come up with. Music is emotionally rendered math, isn't it? There's an order to it, and the order in music brings a sense of cohesion to reality on an emotional level. We didn't even hear words tonight. We heard, we heard music without words, and it brought such a sense of peace and and that, wow, there's something beautiful going on in the universe, even amid all the ugly things going on in the universe. So we're going to discover this evening that beauty is extremely important to the methodology by which God accesses the human heart and saves the human soul. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for, for exposing us this evening to the beauty of sound in the form of music. Our hearts are lifted, God. We feel deeply impressed that there is an order to the universe, that there is indeed something transcendent about reality, that the chaos and the confusion and the ugliness that haunts our world is not the final word, that everything ugly is going to come untrue in the end, Lord. And that, in fact, everything beautiful will go on and on and on for eternity future. So, Lord, please communicate with us this evening. Open our minds. Open our hearts to you. Help us to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, growing young is a very, very, as Pastor Wright said to us, a very odd theme. Uh, when... Ed asked me to be the speaker for this event, I think over a year ago, I immediately said yes because I have two daughters that live in this area, two grandsons, and because Taco Mamacitas is downtown in Chattanooga. If you haven't been there, you need to go to Taco Mamacitas sometime. Amazing tacos. That's really why I'm here. <laughs> the daughters, the grandsons, and the tacos. But I said, immediately, I said, yeah, yeah, for sure, I'll do it, Ed. And I didn't even know what the theme was. Had no idea. When I discovered what the theme was, growing young, I was so excited. I have immense respect for the leadership of this conference that they would be courageous enough 
to face the realities that pertain to Seventh-day Adventist young people and to channel energy and focus and resources in that direction. That's where my heart's at. That's where my heart has been at since my own baptism into Christ at 18 years of age, out of a very unbelieving, postmodern, Southern California surfer culture that knew nothing about God, I was introduced to this message that we hold dear as followers of Jesus and Seventh-day Adventists. Now, the first idea that was ever introduced into my mind, into my consciousness as a teenager, the first spiritual idea was the profound reality that God is love. Now, I know that sounds simple, and we say it so often that sometimes we can go into intellectual neutral and think, you know, yeah, 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 for sure, God is love, but, but what does that mean? Well, for me, as a teenager growing up in a very, very postmodern secular world, and God was nowhere on the radar, the notion that God is love was revolutionary for me. And that's an understatement. Because the moment I realized that God is love, I realized that I lived in a world and in a universe upon which freedom was the premise for my existence. Because if love, if love is the ultimate reality that defines our existence as the creation of God, then freedom is necessary to the existence of that love. That was the truth that turned my whole life upside down as a teenager, as a young man. That was the thing that led me to Christ. And I came to believe that all of Christian theology, biblical theology, Adventist theology is grounded in that one belief. Sometimes people ask me, hey, you're a Christian, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, what do you believe? And I'll just say to them, I have, I have one fundamental belief. I know we have 28, but hear me out. I believe one thing. I believe God is love. That's my doctrine. That's the thing I believe. And everything else that I believe is an extension of that one primary foundational defining reality. And any doctrine, any truth that doesn't line up with that reality is not worth retaining. God is love. That is the overarching truth of Scripture. And that is the reality that defines who God is and we exist this evening because God is love. Creation itself, of which we are a part, creation itself is God's love actualized in material form. So here we are. We exist because God is love. If God was not love, we would not exist. Love, by its very nature, is creative because it desires fellowship. It's other-centered in its orientation. And that other-centeredness gave rise to the impulse to create in God. And here we are. We exist because God is love. Now, what we're going to discover is that God's love is a reality that gives us eternity future for sure. So we're going to, you could say, age. We're just going to get older and older and older for all eternity future, for sure. Next thing you know, you'll be a million years old. And then a, and then a billion years old. I mean, you, you think you're old now? You're going to get really old, but you will, in that eternity future, never age. Now, the idea, the idea of growing young, think about it for a minute. We have a word in the English language for the process of growing old. It's called aging. We don't have a word for the notion, the process of growing young, because it is an impossibility on a biological level. You literally cannot biologically grow young. And yet our theme is growing young. Well, the truth is, that you can grow older biologically and you can simultaneously, as you age biologically, you can grow younger psychologically, emotionally, relationally, morally. Through innocence, through salvation, through forgiveness. Have you ever fallen in love and you felt young? Have you ever held a newborn in your old arms? 
and felt the vitality of excitement at that new life? What about this? Have you ever experienced what it feels like to be ugly and gross morally, to have sinned, to have been selfish, and then to be forgiven? Suddenly, unilaterally, by an act of God, forgiven? Time just starts to move in reverse. Energy is restored. So, so while we're aging biologically, we can and do, by the grace of God, become younger and younger through the innocence that the gospel gives us as a gift. Mentally, emotionally, in our relationships, we can become younger and more playful as we age. But also, and this is our primary interest this evening, an organization can grow younger demographically. Are you hearing me? It is possible for an organization to get old in its demographic composition. It is possible for an organization to grow young in its demographic composition. This conference, and I so resonate with this desire, is looking for ways and means to grow the church younger demographically. Now, the key word tonight in our time together is reality. And I'm hoping that's on the screen. I can't see what you see, but reality is our key word this evening. You may want to get your phone ready to snap some photos of some of the key points we're going to make on the slides because these are vital truths that we need to understand if, in fact, we're going to grow younger as a church organization. Now, reality is the key word, and here's why. I don't know if you're familiar with the face on the screen, Max Dupree, but he wrote one of the most remarkable leadership books that's ever been written, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. This book was not only a bestseller, it was a bestseller for a reason, for a really good reason, because this guy basically created a leadership model that had a cruciform shape. In other words, he looked at the cross of Calvary and he said, what happened at Calvary, what happened there on the cross of Christ, what are leadership principles that you would derive from a God like that? And so, for example, he said leaders don't inflict pain, they bear pain. That's sounding rather gospel-oriented. Leaders don't inflict pain. Leaders are the ones in an organizational structure that bear pain. Now, he went on to tell us something remarkable about the beginning stages, the very initial process of being a good leader in a cruciform sense after the model of Christ. The first job of the leader is to define reality. And, and I'm telling you that defining reality on an organizational level, whether you're General Motors or General Electric or McKee Food Corporation or the Georgia Cumberland Conference or the Seventh-day Adventist Church, defining reality can be and often is an extremely painful process. It is vitally necessary, however, that we allow reality to be defined if we are going to lead effectively. Because what he's essentially saying is that you can't address a problem intelligently unless you actually know what the problem is. And that requires transparency. It requires honesty. It requires, as we're going to see in a moment, data and reckoning with the reality presented in the data. So you got to tell yourself the truth in order to make any advancements as an organization, and it's true on an individual level as well. Now, you may also be familiar with Ray Dalio. He's 63 years old and recently decided that since he made $18 billion, he's one of the most wealthy investors in the history of American investment, he decided, you know what, I'm just going to share everything I know that made me a multi-multi-billionaire 
And the first principle that he articulates, very similar to Max Dupree, he says that successful people, and this would be true in a spiritual organization as well, in a faith-based organization, this would be true of your family, by the way. This would be true of your marriage. This would be true of your child-raising endeavors. This is true because it's a principle that undergirds the operation of reality. He says successful people are those who can go above themselves to see things objectively and manage those things for change. This, this is what defines good leadership, being able to, to go above yourself by which he means to transcend your subjective involvement with the things and the people and the organization around you to step back far enough to just tell the truth. So leadership at its very foundation involves objective truth-telling. In order for any individual, any marriage, any family, any organization to flourish, there must be objectivity. There must be data. There must be information that you face squarely. You don't sweep it under the rug. It's painful. You bear it. You bear it in order to be proactive to move forward. Now, the title, the theme title for our time together, and I have six sessions with you. In these six sessions and for this entire event is Growing Young. And this theme title comes from a recent book, last few years anyway, called Growing Young. This book is remarkable for the research it presents, and we're going to face some of the brutal research that is involved in this book that assesses what American Christianity, evangelical and Protestant Christianity specifically, but Christianity as a whole, is dealing with. Now, one of the things we need to face We've panned way out now. We're just looking at American culture in general. And we're, we're learning in the research of the book Growing Young, we're learning that the U.S. population in general has about a quarter of the, what is it, 350, 360, 370 million people now. One quarter, 22% of the population um, range in age between 18 and 29. We would call these young adults. But, but here's, here's the downer. Here's the painful part. And this is Christianity, evangelical Christianity as a whole. And that is that the same age group, 18 to 29, only compose about 10%, about 10% of church attendance. And so that big number there, 90%, these are, these are people who are, I guess you would say, old or older, if you do what I've done for years and years and years, and I just crisscross around this country and around the world, preaching and speaking in Seventh-day Adventist churches, I've, I've seen with my own eyes a very, very clear cross-section of what Adventism looks like. I know what it looks like in, in an institutional setting like this where there are going to naturally be a lot more young people, right? I mean, we have a university here, praise God. But, but, but if you go out of these institutional settings and you just visit our beloved denomination, it's old. It's old. Now, there's nothing wrong with old people uh, from the appearance of it. Some of y'all are old people. There's nothing wrong with being old. But what we're going to discover is that in order for the church to flourish even for the older people, the focus, the energy, and the resources need to be channeled to the young people. And the whole organization rises to the degree that the focus is channeled in that direction. So this is, this is Christianity in general. Now watch this. Ages 18 to 29, what did we just discover in the book Growing Young? About 10% of evangelical attendance. For Seventh-day Adventists, about 4% of Adventist attendance across the United States is composed of that age group. About 4%. So we're, we're, we're doing worse than the general Christian population, but, but, but listen, don't, don't feel absolutely um, depressed about these numbers as though we're alone. The numbers aren't that different from the general population. Something is happening. Christianity 
in the West is undergoing a slow, painful demise. Now, it doesn't have to be that way as we're going to discover in our six sessions together, but, but listen, listen. If you compare Adventism to evangelical Christianity in general, the numbers are abysmal for both categories, all right? Seventh-day Adventists aren't peculiarly stupid or idiotic or bad. We are our own version of the universal confusion. As Seventh-day Adventists, we don't really have, let me put it to you this way, we don't really have so much Seventh-day Adventist problems. We have human problems. We have human problems, and we have our peculiar, unique Adventist versions of those human problems. And so we're going to be addressing this on a much larger scale. That number is chilling. It's depressing. We don't want to look at it too long, but about 4% of those who attend across the board in the United States of America on any average Seventh-day Adventist church, Sabbath morning, about 4% of them are what we would call young people. I've been to churches where there's not a solitary young person in sight. They're just, they're just missing. They're just not there unless you're in an institutional setting like this. We, we, we have numbers that, that we have uncovered that suggest, and I, I think this might be a little bit high, and the number fluctuates between 60 and 70 percent of those who go through our own educational institutions we lose. It, 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 it's hard. The average age, the median age of a Seventh-day Adventist in North America is 51. 51. We need to start practicing the health message just to give the illusion of youth. That's the median age, okay? And you don't, by the way, need all eight laws of health. They're all recommended. I suppose that they're all good. All you need is the three great laws of health. A lot of exercise, a lot of blueberries, and a lot of romance. Those are the three great laws of health. And there are five more. You can look them up yourself. Okay, so the book goes on, and it says something remarkable to us, and I'm quoting from the book now. No major Christian tradition is growing in the U.S. today. So, so, so we as Seventh-day Adventists, we're not peculiarly bad in this regard. There is no major Christian tradition that is growing in the United States today. American congregations are aging demographically across the board. We're experiencing the same exact phenomenon that has occurred in Western European countries, which, by the way, is sweeping east now in Europe. We won't talk about that in great detail right now. But the fact is that the book goes on to, in a very painful way, and again, I'm just reminding us that the key word tonight is reality, and that part of leadership is to face reality. And I'm operating on the assumption that all of us are leaders, by the way, because all of us have influence to exert on behalf of this church we love. So the book goes on and says, let's make the statistics that they've just outlined, let's make that statistic a bit more personal. The authors of the book say, visualize a photograph of the young people in your congregation. Go ahead, everybody just visualize the faces of the young people in your congregation. Now the point is, some of you can't picture anyone right now. You just, I mean, there's just nobody coming to mind. But those of you who can, just picture them in your mind. And then the authors go on and confront us with reality. Now imagine holding a red pen and drawing an X through almost 50% of the faces of those young people that you just visualized. That many will fall away from the faith as young adults. It's painful. I was just doing the North American Division Religious Liberty event um, at the church uh, called the Spencerville Seventh-day Adventist Church where Pastor Chad Stewart um, is the pastor, and while I was there, we were talking about these issues, and he recently had 46 young adults come on stage, this big, like, general conference church where everybody from Ben Carson to, um, you know, all kinds of general conference officials and Washington, Washington D.C. political elites attend this church, and, and he had 46 Seventh-day Adventist young people on stage to do some kind of musical number, and as he introduced them, I mean, I don't know if this is the wise thing to do right before your kids are going to sing, but he, he told the congregation, he said, I, I just want you to know 
that by the time they leave college, there are 46 young people up here right now, by the time they leave college, 32 of them will no longer be Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, it was jolting, he told me, for the con congregation. But a part of leadership is to face reality and to tell the truth because there is a point at which we do need to have our attention arrested. We do, we do need to recognize that Adventism, Christianity in general, Adventism as a part of evangelical Christianity that we ourselves are a part of is dying in this country. A slow, painful death. And as we're going to discover, it's not a slow, painful death so much as it is a slow, painful suicide. We'll be getting into that a little bit later. So the, the, the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research for the Seventh-day Adventist Church is, is telling us some encouraging stuff. This is encouraging and discouraging simultaneously. Go ahead and bear reality with me here for a moment. I promise by the time we're done here, I'll share with you some good news of some kind if I can think of any. Okay, so here we go. According to this organization that does all this research at the General Conference for us, and praise God that these are number-crunching people who are presenting this to us, these are individuals that leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church as young people. The type of educational institutions they attended upon leaving. And what the numbers are telling us, check this out, this is extremely crucial to process these numbers, okay? 76%, let's just call it 77, 76.8% of those who did not attend a Seventh-day Adventist primary school leave the church. Those who were in public school. So, but those who did attend at the primary level, a Seventh-day Adventist school, only about 15%, 16% will leave. Well, that's both discouraging and encouraging. We'll see why as we go on. At the secondary level, about 74% of those young people who leave Adventism, this is important to, to realize this, about 74% of them who attend secular public schools will leave, while only about 18% at the secondary level who attend Adventist educational institutions will leave. And then at the bachelor's level, the comparison is 19% to 76%. At the postgraduate level, the number is 8% versus about 88%. This is amazing. And, and I'd like to just summarize the research by saying that what the numbers basically crunch down to is about 4 of 10 that attend our schools stay. Now, now, that feels a little heavy. That feels discouraging. Only four out of ten. Why well, I actually shared that earlier with the 70% number. Okay, that is discouraging. But watch this. Watch this. One of ten that don't attend our schools. So, so here's the bottom line. Our church schools are not a luxury. They are vital. <laughs> they are evangelistic. They are evangelistic. Literally, listen. I don't know your situation, parent, grandparent. If you need to sell your car and have your primary mode of transportation be a skateboard or a pogo stick, you need to sell your car to put your kids, your grandkids through Seventh-day Adventist education. Now that's, that's called hyperbole. I'm exaggerating for effect. But am I? I mean, listen... If you have to drive something that was made in 1990 to put your kids through the system, drive the thing that was made in 1990 rather than 2018. We need to get our priorities straight because these numbers are telling us that Seventh-day Adventist educational institutions are life-saving. People, young people, our young people will inhabit eternity future because of these schools. And we need to let that register and prioritize Seventh-day Adventist education. The next statistic that I find fascinating is the stage at li of life at which most departures occur. The stage of life at which most young people leave the Seventh-day Adventist church is um, as young adults. 
That's, that's the stage of life. So, so what would this mean then? If we, were to, if we were to be courageous leaders who face reality, process reality, and, and act in accordance with that reality, what would this look like? Well, let's go a step further. The primary triggers for departure, mostly as young adults, but anybody who departs, have been mapped out for us. We've done some pretty incredible research. Now, it's probably too small, you can't see all of it, so I've summarized it. There are minor causes. This may come as a surprise to us. There are minor causes and major causes for departure from the church. Some of the minor causes are doubts about God's existence. When we go to those who leave the church and say, I mean, did you leave the church because you became an atheist? The majority of them will say, well, no. I still believe in the existence of God. So, so we're inclined when people begin, especially young people, to leave the church, we want to turn up the apologetics and try to intellectually prove to them why they should believe. While in their minds, they're saying, you don't have to convince me, I believe. I believe God exists. It's not apologetics that I need. Okay? So minor cause number two, doubts about Christianity in general. I mean, who was Jesus? Was he indeed the divine son of God and the savior of the world? Most of those who depart say, yeah, I believe that. I mean, think this through. They still believe that Jesus is who we intellectually believe Jesus is. Minor cause, dislike of worship styles. Listen, we are headed in the wrong direction if we assume that all that's needed to keep our young people are pastors that wear skinny jeans and have cool haircuts and more stylistic music. Now, I'm all for, as you'll see in another presentation, keeping pace with the culture. And I'm going to share with you why it is one of the factors. But listen, those who leave the church, they don't say, you know what, I just, I just couldn't handle the fact that my pastor wears baggy pants. I mean, I want a pastor with skinny jeans, and if the pastor had skinny jeans, I probably would have stayed in the church. It's just not a factor. It's not a factor. Listen, dislike of the pastor or preaching. People put it all on the pastor. No, most of them say, actually, my pastor was kind of cool. I liked him. I didn't leave because of the pastor or his preaching. So what were major causes then? Brace yourself. We need to face this stuff, and this should direct our energies, our resources, marital difficulties. Now, I can tell you, and I won't go into the details because I only have so much time, I do a lot of counseling with young people. Most of my work is with young adults, and a lot of them get married, and what we're witnessing in our culture is more and more of them get divorced sooner than ever before. Marriages are falling apart. Every local church, every conference recognizing that the number one cause for people as young adults to leave the church is that their marriage relationship began to fail, the guilt mounted, and they didn't think they could keep being a part of the church with a failing marriage. So they departed in shame. What would this data direct us to do? Well, one thing it would direct us to do would be to focus a lot of time and energy and resources on building very strong marriages and families. I mean, I recently did an evangelistic campaign for the public that was, in fact, a marriage seminar. This should direct our energies, our attention, our focus. Number two, perceived hypocrisy in the church. We're going to talk about that in a future evening, a little bit more detail. The fact is that the second highest cause that people gave for leaving the church as young adults was, you know what? It just didn't look authentic. It didn't look real. There were people who were doing dastardly deeds and then claiming to serve Jesus and standing up and having morning prayer. Uh, you know, my dad, you'll hear this over and over again. My dad was an elder in the church and he yelled and screamed at us all the way to church. You know, you can only process that for so long and the incongruence, the emotional dissonance sets in and you're like, ah, I can't handle the tension between a profession that doesn't match up with reality. 
Okay, number three, and this is crucial. We're going to talk about this more in greater detail. I hope you'll attend every single one of these six sessions if you really want to become a responsible church member and church leader. Lack of friends in the church. <laughs> Man, I feel so strong about this. Jesus, literally, the God of the universe, when he was in heaven prior to the incarnation, thinking, you know, I need to save them. They've rebelled. They've fallen. The human race is in chaos. How shall I save them? He said, I know. I'll go eat with them. The gospel says Jesus, God, came incarnation to the world. Jesus came eating and drinking. The God of the universe literally came to save us through socializing us into his love. The social process is not peripheral. Churches have to be centers of friendship. Lasting, long, deep relationships need to occur there. Those who have friends in the church very, very rarely depart from the church. We'll say more about that as we go on through our time together. Also, another high cause of departure from the church, high levels of conflict in the church. I won't name any conferences, but I ask a lot of questions as I interact with church leaders. And uh, one conference uh, president told me, yeah, you know, we have, we have 100 Seventh-day Adventist churches in this particular geographic area. 100. And all of them, but about 20, are in the process of dying. I said, well, can you identify why they're dying? They said, yeah, we've, we've actually traveled around and worshiped at all of them, and we've done our own kind of, you know, observe, observational research, just paying attention, going and visiting, visiting, preaching at the churches, visiting. So, so why are they dying, I said to the conference president. He said, well, he said, to be quite honest, this one over here, they're arguing over whether or not the King James Version of the Bible is the only one that should be allowed in the pulpit. This one over here, they're arguing over whether or not cheese should be allowed at the potluck. This one over here, they're arguing over what kind of music is per permissible. This one over here, they're addicted to Walter Weith videos and trying to figure out who the Jesuits are in the church. <laughs> this one over here, they're, they're arguing over you get my point. Whether the Trinity is a true doctrine or not, is the Holy Spirit a person? Is Jesus who he, he claimed to be as the eternal Son of God? Is 144,000 a literal or a symbolic number? Am I out of line to say, who cares? <laughs> the fact is that local Seventh-day Adventist churches are oftentimes being ripped to shreds by extremist, fanatical views that are being made the center of attention. And young adults can only handle so much of it. It doesn't ring true. They have a very high level of unpretentious intuition. And it doesn't look right for people who claim to love and serve Jesus together to be constantly at one another's throats about minor peripheral issues that are not salvational. A high level of conflict in the church is one of the major causes. And then family conflict. This information should drive us to strengthen family ministry at the local level, at the conference level. To really give some time, energy, some study, some resources to what it looks like to provide environments for development and growth and strength to be achieved in family units. Conflict resolution. Doubts about Adventist doctrine is on the lower end of the major ones. But I'll tell you this. I, I know a lot of Seventh-day Adventist young people do a lot of ministry on our campuses across the country and internationally. And I'll tell you this. I've got a group of friends at Loma Linda University. All like seven, eight of them, for all intents and purposes, backsliders. But they're going through the Adventist system. They believe all the doctrines. So much so that this group of dudes, for their entire education at Loma Linda, were going over to Las Vegas to gamble all the way up until sundown on Friday. <laughs> at which point, they would go sit in their hotel room waiting for the sun to go down 
on Saturday night so they could resume their backsliding. <laughs> and then they were paying tithe on their winnings. <laughs> Adventism runs deep, people. <laughs> people who leave the Seventh-day Adventist church generally don't say, you know what, I just don't believe it's factually true anymore. Now, some do leave for that reason. But most of them say, no, I still believe that the doctrines are factually true. Conference presidents have told me over and over again, we have a bunch of people who still pay tithe that don't attend church. They were raised to pay tithe, and they hear their mother's voice in their head. They pay tithe. So these are some of the major causes. Now, one of the individuals that is a a key counselor and source of information for the growing young research is Pastor Erwin Raphael McManus from the Mosaic Church in Los Angeles. And he summarizes what he thinks makes for a healthy church out of the growing young research. And McManus says that healthy churches reach young people. That's just what it looks like to be a healthy church. And young people make churches healthy in general. Let, let, let me put it to you this way. Channeling our primary focus and energy, I would add resources, to the 15 to 30-year-old mind will produce the highest general health of the church. You say, no, 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 no. We need to keep everything focused on where the older minds are. But here's the truth of the matter. If you focus on the young people, the older people like to live under the illusion that they're young too. <laughs> I experience this all over the place. I speak at camp meetings and they say, oh, you're speaking for the young adults. And I say, what's that age group? Well, that's like 18 to 59. <laughs> for some reason, they're going over there. You get the point. The point is that if you aim for the minds of young adults, you take in the largest possible swath of members who will identify with that way of processing Adventism. So premise matters. And that's where I want to go as we draw this to a close. Certainly you've heard the story about the City slicker, the city boy who got lost on these back roads in Tennessee. You've heard of him, right? Completely lost on the back roads of Tennessee. Found an old timer and asked for directions to his desired destination. The old timer looked at him and in all dead seriousness said, you can't get there from here. <laughs> he said, what do you mean I can't? get there from here. Can't you get anywhere from here? No, 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 not there though. You can't get there from here. Well, where would you suggest I start? And he said, well, from a location that would get you where you want to go. <laughs> and this ain't it. You can't get there from here. Premise matters. You need to start with a good premise, and the premise that I'm going to share with you for our six-part series this evening is the premise that I'm going to call the power of attraction. The power of attraction. By power of attraction, I mean simply this, that the God of the universe is opting for love as the mechanism of salvation, not force, not manipulation, not any form of of externally imposed authority, but God is going to save you and me and our young people by the sheer power of his love alone or not at all. Amen. There's a line that even the God of the universe won't cross. We're about to discover what that line is through the prophet Hosea, who received the strangest possible mission that God has ever sent anyone on. All the other prophets received visions and dreams with their eyes closed, no doubt laying down in bed. And then they came out of their visions and wrote down what they saw in their heads. God said, Hosea, I'm not going to give you a prophecy. I'm going to make you a prophecy. I want you to enact a prophecy for me. I want you to be the prophecy. So the Lord said to me, Hosea, 
testifies, the Lord said to me, Hosea, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel. This is just astounding. God says, hey, Hosea, here's your mission. You're my prophet, and I want my people to understand something. So you're going to enact a prophecy for me. Here's what I want you to do, Hosea. I want you to fall in love with her. Yes, Hosea, her. That particular woman, Gomer, fall in love with her, Hosea. Love her with every fiber of your being. And Hosea, when you feel what it feels like to love someone with all your heart and mind and body and soul, tell my people, tell my people, Hosea, that when she has violated the integrity of your love for her and doesn't love you back, Tell them, Hosea, tell them that's what it's like to be God. What is it like to be God? Well, what it's like to be God is to feel the feelings of a jilted lover. What it's like to be God is to love you and me with every fiber of his divine being, only to have us not love him back. So what is he going to do, this, this lover God? searching for his beloved. What is he going to do? I mean, this is God after all, almighty God, the most powerful person in the universe. Certainly he could just pull rank, exert some authority, tell us what to do or else. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. And that's, that's where the gospel resides in that whatever he wants part. There's one thing he doesn't want. Let me just tell you. If there's one thing God Almighty, emphasis on Almighty, if there's one thing God Almighty doesn't want, it's control. What God wants is responsible free moral agency in which we voluntarily love him back. Not because we have to, but because we want to. And why would we want to? Well, because God is beautiful in the extreme. And those who see God in all his beauty find themselves attracted, drawn to him. So what is God going to do? We're like, we're like a corporate body of adulterers, the whole human race. The sin problem is basically unfaithfulness. It's a lack of fidelity on a relational level. It's not merely breaking cold, hard rules on tables of stone. Sin is the breaking of God's law, and the law is love. So to transgress the law is to transgress God's love. It's a relational breakdown. But listen, God says, okay, you've rebelled against me. I love you. You don't love me back. Tell my people, Hosea, that's what it's like to be God. So God maps a plan. He says, I'll tell you how I'm going to save them. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. The her here is the corporate human race. In the local historical sense, it's Israel. But in the eschatological sense, it's the human race, the fallen human race. And God says, says you don't love me. That's the nature of the problem. So how am I going to get you back? How am I going to save you? How am I going to redeem you? Well, I'm going to do it by alluring you. I will allure her, you, to myself. I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak comfort to her. Another version says, I will get her alone and speak words of love to her. This is the God of the universe. I'm going to save you by loving you. I'm going to save you by alluring you to myself. What a strange word for the God of the universe to use. I'm going to allure you? What are some synonyms for that word? Well, to attract, to draw. This is a prophecy of the gospel that the novelist Dostoevsky summarized when he said in The Idiot, putting the words in the mouth of the idiot in the novel who finally realizes the truth, that beauty will save the world. That the God of the universe is operating on the premise that love necessitates freedom. And where there is freedom, there needs to be 
attraction. There needs to be beauty. Jesus died on the cross as the fulfillment of this prophecy in Hosea. When he hung between heaven and earth and said that anyone who sees the spectacle of this sacrifice will be drawn to me, not pushed, not manipulated, not coerced, drawn, attracted, allured. This is the Bible saying to us in the gospel, kind of whispering into our hearts, God is beautiful if you would just open your eyes and see it. God is beautiful. Well, Ellen White says it this way in a single line that we could just memorize together right now. Only by love is love awakened. Only by love is love awakened. That's the premise, that's the gospel premise upon which God is operating in the plan of salvation. She says it in another sentence like this in the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Love is the agent God uses to expel sin from the heart. Not authority, not power, not manipulation, not obligation, not externally imposed, nothing. Love alone is the agent God uses to expel sin from the heart. So back to Hosea. And this is the most amazing thing that you and I could ever realize. The same God who just in the previous verse, verse 14, says, okay, okay, here's how I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you by alluring you. I'm going to save you by attracting you. In the day of that attraction, God says, and it shall be in that day. This is the day of the Messiah. This is the day of the cross of Christ. This is the day when Jesus, the God of the universe, shows up in the world and is crucified as the ultimate demonstration of God's love for you and me. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and you will no longer call me my master. And just feel the gravity of this transition. This is, this is what we might call the ultimate paradigm shift. I mean, seriously. The ultimate paradigm shift from perceiving God as a master who's imposing external commands to basically falling in love with a God who woos the heart through attraction and alluring. God says, I want you to go through something. I want you to go through a transition in your perception of me, in your, in your immaturity, in your fallenness, in your, in your guilt and shame. You perceive me through the lens of your guilt as a master making demands. But when you receive my forgiveness, you will begin to fall in love with me and your heart will undergo a transition from perceiving me as a master making external demands to a lover alluring your heart into relationship with me. You will, you will go from my master to oh, God's my husband. What a paradigm shift. What a paradigm shift. And then in verses 19 and 20, God himself, the God of the universe, drops to one knee and says, I mean, it's a marriage proposal. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you. I will marry you spiritually forever, salvationally. I will marry you. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and mercy. These are words that are describing how God will relate to us in order to allure us. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. You will enter into salvational intimacy with me on the premise of my love for you, not on the premise of your love for me. God's love in the gospel is primary and unilateral. Our love is secondary, responsive. The gospel is first and foremost the objective reality of God's love for you and me in Christ apart from anything you and I could ever do to earn his love. The gospel says I love you no matter what you do and there's nothing you could do to make me love you any more than I already do. There's nothing literally you could do to make me love you less. I already love you. 
with the totality of my love because God is love and he is not dependent on external factors to change who he is. The objective facts of the gospel are present and all accounted for in the person of Christ. Salvation is a done deal in Christ historically. And that love moves inside of us. It allures us. It attracts us. And we find ourselves reaching out to him. I said this evening that the key word tonight is reality. Well, the bottom line is that the reality of God's love is the only power powerful enough to attract and hold our hearts and that includes the hearts of our children and our young people. Adventism desperately needs to be immersed in the gospel of Christ. The primary thing that we need to, quote unquote, do in order to rectify the painful realities that we encountered in the statistics this evening is to exalt and magnify Jesus in all his irresistible beauty. The gospel needs to be preached in Adventism. And as the gospel is preached, as his grace is magnified, children and young people will be attracted from the inside out. And that's the reality. That's the reality of the good news of the gospel that we need to close upon this evening in order to kind of hold our hearts after all of the statistics that we've seen that make us feel so bad about ourselves. Listen, God is not done with us, but we need to face the hard realities of our situation, and then face the beautiful realities of the gospel that are so healing and redeeming that everything, everything, everything good that we could possibly imagine is in God's heart and mind for you and me. Father in heaven, you're incredible. You're beautiful. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.